Uh, okay, so as Alan was saying, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, just fight off drug control and some work that we did here in North Carolina. Okay, so um, Phytophthora fruit rot and watermelon is caused by Phytophthora capsaicae, which is not a true fungus, it's something called an omycete, uh, which is actually more closely related to algae. Um, so this is a pathogen that really likes water. Um, and also another important thing to, to note is that products that are really good for fungi are not necessarily good for omycetes. It's just that for us to call things omycytes is too complicated. So we just clump them all in the word fungicides, but uh, different modes of action are effective for omycetes. Um, so it's going to be important later when we talk about chemical control. Uh, so here you can see the typical symptoms that you see in a bunch of different hosts. Uh, as you know, it goes to many, many different crops that you all grow. You know, a lot of folks are doing watermelons and peppers. Uh, which is a really hard rotation because peppers are also very susceptible. Um, this is a pathogen that has um, sort of like sexes called mating types. And when they reproduce in the field, they uh, generate this like survival structure that is really hard to manage uh, in the long term. Uh, we also have really few sources of host resistance, at least for watermelon. Do we have some for pepper? And another issue is because it is a pathogen that actively uh, undergoes sexual reproduction, it is able to develop fungicide resistance relatively easily. Uh, so we do need to be monitoring fungicide resistance uh, regularly when possible. Um, so again, I just really wanted to very briefly touch on the disease cycle to emphasize how important the spores are for disease control. So. This pathogen produces this kind of little lemon-shaped structures called sporangia that in the microscope, they look like little crystals. And when those get exposed to water, they differentiate in you know 60 swimming zoospores. So water literally makes this disease 60 times worse. So water is really, really important. And then again, the second important spore is this one, the oospore. So this one only forms if in your field you have both the A1 and the A2 mating types. That's important because when you have just one of these by themselves, the winter may kill them. <laughs> but once you have the oospore, the pathogen is able to essentially persist in your field and infest it. So those are important things to keep in mind with this pathogen. Okay, so water management is super important to control Phytophthora because remember, it is an algae cousin and a water lover. So this is a squash field here in North Carolina that I visited a few years ago. And I wanted to show it to illustrate that, you know, when possible, having fields that drain well and that are a little bit more even is a good idea so that you don't have that situation of water staying there for a long time, especially if you already have the pathogen in your field. Because what happens is that the fruit that's infected is then differentiated into zoospores and all these guys are just kind of swimming down the row with the water, right? So you can almost like track the spread of the pathogen based on where the water is going. Uh, and then another thing is that, you know, if you leave your calls in the field, they can essentially become also sources of inoculum. And I have seen this sometimes with folks that are using um, surface irrigation water. They may have their call pile close to that water, um, and then that can essentially run off and infest that irrigation water. And that's a really easy way to get your pathogen into your field. So that um, debris management of keeping it away from irrigation water is really important when possible. Uh, the other thing that really helps is finding ways to limit soil splashing, which again, is a little bit challenging because mulch would only do so much. Uh, so having you know, raised beds and plastic mulch is a good idea to kind of um, protect a little bit from that splashing. That said, typically what happens in the watermelon situation is that your fruit is sitting in between the rows, as Gordon was mentioning. Something that a few of the growers I have worked with with this issue have done that is really labor intensive but is helpful is to train the vines a little bit as the plants grow, if possible, to try to have the fruit sit on the plastic mulch, if possible, because then you get a lot more out of your sprays because you're eliminating that constant contact with the, uh, with the soil. Uh, but I know that's hard. Um, and then, of course, avoiding overhead irrigation when you already have this pathogen in the field, it's a good idea just to not have uh, inoculum essentially splashing everywhere. Um, 
the irrigation water is a real thing. So a lot of you are just using well water or maybe even city water and you don't have to worry about this. But if you're using ponds, creeks, any kind of surface water, this is something to keep in mind. They can become infested. And then if you're irrigating your field with that, this is essentially what's gonna happen. You overhead irrigated with the pathogen, your entire field, and then it melts. Um, so it's something to really keep in mind is that if your irrigation water is infested, you're kind of negating every other good thing you're doing with the mulch and the race beds and your really, really good spray programs, right? Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about a case of irrigation water. And actually, I have worked through a few in the state like this one, but I think it's a good example. So I had someone call me a few years ago that is just a very good grower, excellent practices, excellent spray program, and they had a really devastated field. And I immediately asked about the irrigation water and they told me that they were taking it from a surface source. So we tested it. So the way we do this is that we grab a sample of water from a few different places and just like a sterile bottle. We bring it to the lab and a uh, funny story, Phytophthora capsis it really likes hemp seeds. <laughs> so we UV sterilize them. Yeah, I know I see you all laughing, <laughs> but uh, we sterilize them in the lab, cut them in half and essentially use those to fish for the pathogen. So because remember it forms the swimming spores, literally the spores swim to the hemp seed and then it attaches to it. So we take advantage of that to then put the, the pathogen in culture media and see if it grows. So that's how we can tell if a water source is infested with a pathogen or not. Uh, years ago, I used to do this in my lab um, just to help people, but the um, request got too intensive that we had to stop. <laughs> but now the clinic is offering the service. So I'll show you that in a little bit. So in this case, um, I recommended the person to try to either switch irrigation sources, which obviously they could not do it, or install a filtration coordination system, which they are expensive, but they are effective. So this is just like a picture from like Google, but essentially you install uh, a filtration coordination system so that you can pump your water through it and treat it. And then we retested the water, you know, essentially before and after the filtration coordination treatment and it worked wonderfully, right? Even though there was like a ton of pathogen before, after the treatment, it was all good. So those are things that you can consider just, you know, if you keep having issues with this pathogen, even though you're doing everything right, suspect your water and make sure that you get it looked at if you think this is an issue for you. And um, as I was saying, a really, really great thing about this um, is that, well, you can get the filtration coordination system if you think you have that issue. And the clinic now offers this as a service. So you can actually get your water tested if you want to. Uh, by the clinic if you are interested in doing this. Uh, and remember, this is only relevant for surface irrigation water. Wells and city water, you're all good. Okay, so now that we have eliminated water as a risk, uh, let's talk about the oospores because that's the other really big issue. So as I was explaining to you all, um, the pathogen has two sort of sexes that we call mating types. Oh, and this is a typo, this should be A1 and A2. So essentially, this is an A1 and an A2 isolate in a culture media. And in here, where they're touching and becoming friends, they're forming oospores. Okay, so if you blow that up in a microscope, this is what we see. We see a bunch of oospores, millions of them. And as you can kind of see here, and you'll see better here, it has a really, really thick cell wall. So these things are tough. These things can stay in this hole for years. They will survive nuclear warfare. They will be here well after we're all gone. Um, so this is what becomes really a problem with your field becoming infested. Um, so there has been anecdotal evidence of people perceiving that, you know, these oospores are surviving for like more than 10 years, right? Uh, our researcher in University of Illinois uh, Dr. Mohamed Babadus a few years ago actually made an experiment to try to test this and figure out, okay, is it really, um, you know, surviving that long? And his research was able to determine that it really seemed that the three-year rotation was the magic number. So if you are able to have a three-year rotation from non-hosts of PCAPCC, that could really, really clean up your soil. I know that's really hard because again, uh, the really cool crops that you all like to grow are hosts and pretty much the only safe bet are like, you know, field crops, cereal type stuff, um, you know, grasses, uh, corn, all these things. Um, 
so that's tricky. And, and also, you know, you kind of have to think about weeds and volunteers also being reservoirs of that. So it's, it's difficult, but it can be done. If you have a really heavily infested field, it's something you can consider is to just do this really strict three-year crop rotation to like, you know, talk about the fungicides. Uh, so some generalities and things to consider. Product efficacy, again, a reminder, every OMI seed, um, including picapsacy, can quickly develop fungicide resistance. In North Carolina in particular, we have documented fungicide resistance to methanoxam, which you all know as Ritamol Gold, to fluopicolide, which you all know as Presidio, and dimetamor, which you all know as Forum. That doesn't mean that the isolates in your field are resistant, but it does mean that there are resistant isolates in the state. So if you feel that you're using some of these chemistries and they're not working or other chemistries, just start thinking about um, diversifying your spray program, uh, rotated modes of action to really um, you know, combat that fungicide resistance. The other thing is obviously application timing is really important. You really have to think about it like you, the job of your fungicide is to create a force field around your fruit because your fruit is going to touch the soil. And if the pathogen's there, there's not a whole lot you can do if your fruit is not on the mulch, right? Uh, so when you spray, it needs to be when the fruit is small enough that you're protecting it before it touches the soil. And you have to spray with really, really good coverage. So it's really like completely, completely covered with that really effective fungicide that you're applying. So those things are really important no matter what the product that is that we're talking about. Um, and then also think about the weather because again, water. Water is a huge issue with this pathogen, right? So if there's a lot of rain, you may need to apply products more frequently. Or if you have products that are like fast dry that you might be able to apply before and after rain events, that's a good idea. If you have a heavily infested field that you know it's kind of like your problem field, uh, those are just things to keep in mind of how to best utilize your, your fungicides. So I'm gonna start telling you about trials and I'm tell, gonna tell you briefly about this thing called MELCAS because this is something that we evaluated uh, in collaboration with a couple of two states. Okay, so MELCAS is sort of like one of this um, forecasting type tools that are for watermelon and, and melon growers that is weather spray. So it gives you kind of like this environmental favorability index uh, for disease and tells you when to spray. So in other states, there has been reports that folks that are using this are saving themselves, you know, two to three sprays and not losing any fungicide efficacy. So we wanted to evaluate it along with like our regular um, programs that we're using. So, and this is uh, hosted by Purdue, by Dr. Dan Egel. I think it's still going. I think now you may have to pay a little bit, but it's not very expensive if anyone is curious. Um, okay, so we did this efficacy trial back in 2016. And as you can see here, we evaluated several programs, alternating very different products that you will be using probably to some extent. And then we have one treatment that was dictated by Melcast forecasting, just to see how that would work. Um, the varieties were used were Wonder and Michelias the Pollinizer. Uh, we transplanted in like May and then ran the trial for you know, about 14 weeks. This data is at week 12. We started spraying at week five and we did it weekly or um, based on what Melcas would say because Melcas obviously changes like the timing of your application. Um, this was a bare ground field. It had overhead irrigation and we actually inoculated this because this was at a research station. So this was kind of like tons of disease type situation, right? Hopefully you would never have this in your own fields. Um, so if you see here the graph, what you have here is the treatments and then the disease severity uh, of picapsacy fruit rot and watermelon. So here we have your non-treated. And as you can see, we had tons of disease. And um, most treatments except this guys were different at least from the non-treated uh, somewhat, but really the best treatment was Melcast. Um, to my surprise, because I have never had a lot of good luck with a lot of these forecasting programs, but in this case, it did work really well. Um, so that was something to consider. We repeated this experiment, but um, well, actually we did it before in 2014 in collaboration with Georgia and South Carolina, because since every state has a little bit of a different pathogen population, different fungicide efficacy, we just kind of wanted to see in general how things looked, right? 
Very similar treatments. We also included the MELCAS option. Um, same information as far as like, <clears throat> excuse me, trial conditions. Um, lots of disease. Also, the green is North Carolina, like the darker green is North Carolina. And the best uh, treatment that we had was really the alternation between Sampro and Arondis. And that continues to be true with all our uh, trials that we have done. Really, Arondis Ultra has been a really, really good product for us. And one that I unfortunately don't have data that I can show you. Uh, but um, actually, no, we do have it here, Illumin, actually, at the boxon. That fungicide has also performed really, really well in our trials, which is good because, as I was saying, uh, Presidio has been performing less well. Forum has not been as great. Uh, but Illumin or on this Ultra are good. Sampro has its years. You know, some years it looks really great. Some years it looks a little bit less great. And I think it's because uh, Sampro is a two-component fungicide. And one of the components is, um, is one of the fungicides that Omicis developed resistant to. So essentially it becomes like a single component fungicide. Uh, so if your Sampro is not working, just uh, keep in, in mind that, that fungicide resistance has been reported for this one. Um, and then of course, Randman is, has been a really good product through the years. And yeah, and I think that's about it I have, I have as far as efficacy. Uh, but as you can see, you know, when you alternate different modes of action, you definitely get some gain um, on control. Uh, the problem is that the fungicide efficacy is going to be a little bit field specific depending on your population. So um, keep an eye on that. Um, so just to round up um, all that we visited today, remember, algae cousin. So water management is a big, big thing. Uh, try to do anything you can to keep water off of your fruit. I know it's really hard, <laughs> uh, but raise beds, train vines if you can. This surprisingly really, really helps because once your fruit is in the plastic mulch and you spray, that takes a ton of risk out of it. But I know it's crazy labor intensive to do. Um, plastic mulch, drip irrigation. Always keep in mind your irrigation water. If anyone at any point thinks you have issues with irrigation water, please reach out to me because, because it's something that can be fixed and it's something that can have a huge impact in your operation that you may just not be aware of it. Um, and then again, when fungicide applications, try to make sure your products are working, reach out to us if you need help with this. Uh, make sure that you're keeping in mind the timing. Remember, you need to put that force field on your tiny little fruit before it touches the soil. That's the goal. Uh, and again, in North Carolina, we have not found resistance yet to around this Ultra, Sampro, Illumin, and Randman. In other states, they have reported resistance to Sampro, but not us. So those are some options that you can have there. And consider your three years of crop rotation to not host if you have a persistent uh, pick up CC field in your hands already. And um, I'm not going to go into detail with this, but uh, hopefully a lot of you are already familiar with my lab website. Everything I do, I post there. It's freely available. There's a tab that is literally called for growers. So you can find there all that stuff. You have disease fact sheets, all the results from our fungicide and variety trials. Uh, production guides, all the things. So you can go and check what products are working. Uh, the data is there for you to look at free. Um, and then of course, you know, there's resources like in the portals, which hopefully you're aware of, um, the clinic and all our production guides. Uh, we and Jonathan and a lot of us in North Carolina, and it's a multi-state effort. We collaboratively update recommendations in this handbook. So this really has a lot of minds together put into recommendations. So um, check out that book when you're thinking about picking fungicides. And that is reflected in the North Carolina Atkin manual also. We do both that way. Uh, and with that, I just want to really thank my lab. A lot of this work was done by Mike Adams and Camilo Parada and some folks that are not in the lab any longer. And of course, thanks for all our collaborators, grower cooperators. So many of you have given me so, so many letters for grants. Thank you. <laughs> I know they're a pain to write. Extension agents, of course, that help us find field sites and all sorts of things for ex experiments. In our facilities, the clinic, the research stations in particular, all my research pretty much requires having disease nurseries. And I am very lucky that the research stations really, really helped me with that. Um, the genomics core and our funding, uh, especially QCAP, which has funded a lot of the watermelon work I did for a few years. Mm -hmm.